Dean, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Ivana Yellow, and I'm hosting today Ross Clark's seminar. I'm very happy to be hosting Ross, who's a good friend and colleague for many years. Um, I'd like to give you a brief introduction about uh, Ross's uh, um, uh, accomplishments, and then we'll follow with some rules of engagement about uh, you know the way the uh, conversation is going to go. And then I'd like to remind you that if you want to stick around, we're going to have a happy hour after the um, question and answer section. Um, a brief uh, uh, bio, uh, Ross received his uh, uh, bachelor degree at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a major in aquatic, uh, aquatic biology in 1990. And then, uh, as many of you know, he is a graduate from also any marine laboratories and uh, he graduated in marine ecology in uh, 1996. Uh, between 1998 and 2010, he was an environmental scientist for the California Coastal Commission. Between 2007 and 2016, he was the climate action coordinator for the city of Santa Cruz. And since 2010, he was, yeah, he has been the director of the Central Coast Wetland Group at Mass Landing Marine Labs. And I'd like to uh, cite some of his major uh, uh, co-workers uh, at the CCWG, um, Kevin O'Connor, Kara uh, Clark, and uh, Sarah Duncan. So Ross is, uh, is many things, I would say. He's a coastal scientist who has a very large experience in uh, environmental programming development for coastal communities, and also a strong background in programming development contract management and grant implementation. And uh, he works a lot with the local and state uh, uh, entities to achieve his, uh, their environmental objectives. And those include the wetland restoration research, um, especially nutrient load reduction through wetland restorations and bioreactors, and integrating the environmental objectives with the agricultural business and municipal planning. And finally, as you'll hear today, he's really involved in uh, really spearheading a lot of the work on, uh, on future climate change and effects of sea level rise on coastal environments. Um, he's also an uh, author and promote, you know, it's been promoted uh, programs that have been uh, adopted statewide, including the California Rapid Assessment Method of CRAM. And uh, also he created new methodologies to assess barbed estuaries along California coastlines. Uh, so again, before I give uh, uh, Clark uh, Ross the, the word, I'd like to remind you that if you want to ask questions at the end of the talk, you can raise your hand during the talk and I will take note of your uh, hand and I'll give you the mic afterwards. And again, please stick around after the question and answer section. So we're going to have some informal conversation during happy hour. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ross Clark on this talk on uh, Monterey Bay climate vulnerabilities of natural and man-made ecosystem. Uh, I think you're unmuted, Ross. Are you there? I am muted. Thank you, Ivana. You're welcome. Uh, so as Ivana uh, mentioned, um, I'm one of the staff at the Central Coast Wetlands Group that's down the hill um, uh, in the Sandholt Center uh, next to Moss Landing Marine Labs. And um, there we've been working on applied research, uh, looking, um, working on uh, coastal estuarine and wetland restoration, water quality benefits, and then um, a more recently resiliency of these ecosystems to climate change. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is some of our findings from the number of uh, vulnerability and uh, assessments and adaptation planning processes that we've um, I've been working on since about 2016. Um, in 2016, we were given uh, funding through the Ocean Protection Council to evaluate um, the risks and vulnerabilities of our coastline within the Monterey Bay, and specifically to identify uh, coastal infrastructure that may be compromised by sea level rise, but uh, roads, buildings, uh, harbors, et cetera and identify natural systems that may be impacted by sea level rise as well and how these systems could become more resilient. Um, and then def, uh, as part of that hazard analysis, also identify some appropriate response strategies to reduce the risks um, that we've identified uh, from that analysis. 
Uh, and what, how we started was uh, that um, uh, previous uh, hazard maps had been generated, which um, took global uh, sea level rise projections, changes in wave um, uh, pattern and wave energy, uh, wind and rain um, uh, pattern changes, and developed a set of maps that show areas of the coastline that would be vulnerable to um, uh, the, these different hazards. Um, and here you can see in the, on the left um, a classic example of um, a map showing areas that were, uh, are projected to be within um, a, a sea level rise hazard um, uh, range during different uh, future time periods, 2030, 2060, and 2100 are the three um, pl uh, planning uh, timeframes which we analyze as well as uh, were developed for these models. Um, there are a lot of assumptions that were made as part of those uh, models, um, inc including um, what uh, rate of sea level rise do we use and what, um, uh, which then of course has to do uh, with the amount of carbon emissions that we project will, uh, we will emit into the uh, atmosphere um, since 2010. Um, and uh, you can see the little graph here, you, we have a yellow, an orange, and a red, and those are different levels of carbon emissions with uh, the red being uh, business as usual, uh, taking no, making no effort to reduce carbon emissions, and uh, the yellow being an aggressive uh, actions globally to reduce emissions. And you can see that um, the, these, um, climate action um, uh, strategies can actually um, drive a reduction in sea level rise in the future, which is an important thing to consider as we look through some of the projected hazards. Um, for the analysis, we looked at a medium um, uh, scenario for the 2030 projections and then the worst case for all projections after that. We also looked at, um, had to make assumptions around life expectancy of structures, um, uh, when infrastructure would fail, uh, erosion rates based on these projections, wave overtopping dynamics, et cetera. Um, but fortunately, we had um, some uh, coastal um, uh, engineers and um, uh, wave experts to help um, us understand some of these um, uh, some of these predictions which are embedded within um, the uh, model layers that we, we had access to. And one of the uh, most important things um, when you look at the models and one of the first things we did in our analysis was deconstruct those, um, those maps of doom as I call them and understand what are the underlying forces or hazards that they, um, those uh, layers are predicting. Um, uh, because different um, Parts of the model do predict uh, impacts of cliff erosion associated with changes in wave energy and sea level rise causing increased impacts to the, um, the backshore. Uh, changes in rainfall patterns and higher seas could lead to a greater river flooding. Rising tides, of course, we've, um, is what we've focused on um, uh, mostly as far as um, uh, climate, coastal climate change, the sea level rise. Um, which uh, we're already seeing low-lying areas flood periodically during king tides, but then also storm floods um, associated with higher seas and higher wave energy during winter storms. All of these um, have, uh, pose different uh, risks to our coastal environments, both our built environment and our natural. And those are some of the things that we, want, uh, we sought out to understand and uh, report to our um, uh, natural conservation agencies as well as um, local municipalities on what these um, these risk projections actually mean and hopefully identify ways that we could actually um, come up with adaptation strategies or response strategies to minimize the impacts associated with these hazards. So here are some of the uh, deconstructed um, hazard maps. The one on the left is uh, uh, dune erosion predictions for 2030 is the darkest through 2100 is the lightest for the Moss Landing area, showing that uh, over time uh, 
the dunes are predicted to um, erode uh, inland as uh, wave intensity and uh, water, uh, sea level rises. Um, and you can see a number of um, buildings in uh, red, orange, and yellow. And those, uh, those are time horizons that those um, properties are predicted to be within um, a coastal erosion hazard area. On the right is Rio del Mar, um, north of Moss Landing, and shows the coastal flooding associated with a winter storm and how um, those um, increased wave um, heights could lead to localized flooding of some of the downtown beach uh, communities along our uh, coastline. We also identify in uh, the dotted line and, some, um, and so, uh, some of the dots, some of the other infrastructure that's in place that has been put in place to protect those communities from um, uh, these types of hazards. And we did our best to estimate when that infrastructure uh, would likely fail and would likely need to be either replaced or some other um, a resiliency uh, effort uh, be, uh, be taken at those future time horizons. And through doing that uh, GIS analysis, um, uh, deconstructing the various um, hazard layers, we we're able to show that different areas of the coastline are threatened by different hazards at different times. And here for Moss Landing, uh, the community of Moss Landing, we can see that while most pe uh, people are concerned about rising tides as the um, coastal um, hazard to be focused on, we can show that fl fluvial flooding and the coastal storm flooding uh, pose much greater risks, at least in the near term, to impacts to buildings within Moss Landing and along much of the coastline. Um, these, are, uh, these are not um, hazards that um, repeat every um, 12 hours or every um, uh, lunar cycle, but they are uh, predicted to occur with more frequency as uh, we see uh, changes in rainfall patterns and uh, wave intensity. And so with those analysis and the uh, compilation of uh, risks and the quantification of various infrastructure at risk at different times, we were able to make um, a number of um, findings within these uh, various reports. We did an assessment of Moss, for Moss Landing, the city of Capitola, Monter, um, parts of Monterey County, all of Santa Cruz County, and the city of Santa Cruz as well. Um, and within each of those reports, and you can, you can see the, go find all those reports at our website, um, there's, there's state, uh, statements of um, significant um, uh, vulnerabilities or potential impacts that we, uh, we note from our analysis. For instance, by 2060, the dunes near, near Petrero Road and near the Salinas River mouth are at risk of um, eroding and having waves overtop those portions of the dunes, leading to ocean waves flowing into the old Salinas River, bypassing the coastal protection of the dunes and um, leading to significant um, uh, ocean water flooding of the lower Salinas Valley. Um, with that, we identified that farms are at risk of uh, flooding um, within the lower uh, Salinas Valley uh, due to the combined effects of sea level rise, um, wave over tapping and changes in rainfall um, uh, coming down our watersheds. We also found that um, in Santa Cruz, if we were to protect all the buildings that are vulnerable to flooding or erosion, we'd need to put uh, about um, construct additional seawalls that would um, uh, lead to about 12 miles of the Santa Cruz County coastline being armored to some degree by 2060. Um, uh, with a significant impact to our beach, beach habitat um, due to that kind of action. So these, these are the findings, um, and um, they're included in many of the, um, the vulnerability and risk assessment uh, reports that we have on our website uh, that I noted, including uh, one for the Moss Landing Harbor that we wrote, as well as the, uh, the other municipalities. Um, but the question I wanted to, talk, um, to look into today was how do we use these hazard analysis and this vulnerability reporting um, in a way that leads to strategic adaptation planning? How do we drive future actions based on 
uh, the analysis of these risk models that we've done. And uh, what I want to uh, do for much of the rest of my uh, presentation is go into some of the ways we've been able to share the findings of these vulnerability um, studies with different stakeholders, different agencies, different municipalities, and identify specific hazards um, that those uh, partners are concerned about and um, for which we've identified some um, near-term adaptation um, strategies that could be implemented either easily or with available funding from various state agencies. So let's jump into it. This is what um, I can, uh, can say is what strategic adaptation process looks like in the Monterey Bay. Um, this, these are uh, the studies, the vulnerability reports, the adaptation strategies, um, et cetera, that uh, have been, um, that have come from the initial hazard layers um, initially developed by the Pacific Institute in 2009 and then reanalyzed in various ways and um, put into different plans, vulnerability reports, et cetera, to get us um, from identifying hazards to selecting adaptation um, uh, strategies, and then in some cases actually drafting plans to implement uh, selected um, uh, strategies to move forward. And so I'll show you some of those um, today. So uh, let's delve into uh, one example of a finding that uh, we were able to communicate to our uh, coastal managers, et cetera, um, uh, the significance of this hazard and that has let, then led us to taking action or identifying ways to move forward and take action. Again, um, another 500 coastal buildings are vulnerable to uh, coastal climate change. And if we um, are armored around those buildings, we would um, armor off about 12 miles of the coastline, as I'd said before. What, what we did then was a GIS analysis looking at um, with those backshore armoring, uh, which beach segments are predicted to be lost because of sea level rise leading to coastal squeeze, um, basically losing the beach between the ocean and the backshore because those backshore um, environments are not able to migrate inland. What, we, what happens is the water covers the sand and we lose our beaches. And here's an example in Santa Cruz if we move forward with protecting everything that is vulnerable, what would happen to our beaches over time? With red being areas that are already have a minimal beach area, um, the orange being areas that we lose um, by 2060, and then the yellow being those areas that um, by 2100 will no longer be um, uh, beach areas if we do, um, don't take action um, and we continue to armor our backshore. And so by 2100, what you see is that in um, Santa Cruz County, we either have um, seascape um, near the harbor, um, or um, seabird, right, I'm sorry, by the harbor, or uh, we have to go down to Manresa Beach in South County um, to uh, go to the beach. And th th this kind of findings um, raises people's attention and uh, uh, is something that many people don't find to be a satisfactory um, extrapolation of hazards and likely responses. Um, and we use this to communicate the potential uh, future um, implications of the business as usual approach to dealing with coastal erosion uh, by building seawalls. From that, we suggested that maybe there are alternative options that could be employed better regional strategic planning that could be done and came up with a, an example like this, trying to visualize how we could prioritize different coastal management objectives for different parts of the coastline. Armoring where there is um, significant inf uh, valuable infrastructure um, that's vulnerable, but then identifying other portions of the beaches throughout the county that we may want to take actions either through um, the, uh, removing uh, vulnerable infrastructure or um, uh, beach nourishment or other activities um, 
leading to a more resilient long-term um, beach areas. We also noted river mouths, uh, harbors, um, uh, surf breaks that uh, may um, be appropriate for coastal resource protection. This kind of example of a, uh, an alternative future, uh, if we put our minds to evaluating alternatives and allocating those alternatives in, in time and space, has been um, uh, valued um, and uh, the Coastal Commission actually provided the City of Santa Cruz funding to um, take on this kind of uh, long-term uh, coastal planning process and we're now involved in that process. So the City of Santa Cruz um, is working on a beaches on the West Cliff planning effort uh, that they received funding for last year and we're helping uh, the city look at alternative um, options for the coastline. You can see our little pictorial in front of the, um, the boardwalk of different uh, um, adaptation options that could be used, the costs associated with those, and the pros and cons associated with taking those actions. Uh, for instance, if we armor um, uh, with riprap the boardwalk in front of the boardwalk, we see that we, over time we lose much of our uh, 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 main beach um, because of sea level rise uh, encroaching um, um, from the water side and the armoring on the, uh, um, the inland side. Um, we could uh, have beach nourishment as another option. And then we also have um, examples where we actually move some of the boardwalk and other infrastructure inland so that we can retain um, a, a large open beach. We're now in having communications with um, the public on which alternatives are most attractive and which ones we're willing to um, commit resources to implement. So for this exam, um, for this study, we identified that much of our um, co beaches within Santa Cruz County are in jeopardy if we ha uh, use uh, business as usual uh, management approach. And for this study, we have the goal of identified adapt adaptation alternatives that can retain the unique coastal resources and coastal access opportunities for the coastline. So taking the, the, um, the hazard analysis and establishing a goal and a process to make different decisions based on the environmental um, implications, the ecological implications, and um, the uh, community implications, both the effects on businesses and people, as well as the costs associated with the adaptation alternatives. Another example, um, this is um, a report we did from Moss Landing Harbor and uh, found similar um, hazards. Uh, here, wave overtopping of the Moss Landing Island is predicted to lead to ocean waves and sand draining into Moss Landing Harbor sometime after 2060. Um, f having that finding, uh, we set a goal to identify short and long-term adaptation strategies that we could recommend to the harbor um, that they could uh, uh, take on to increase the resiliency and uh, the long-term uh, viability of the harbor as, um, as a resource. And here are some example um, maps of identifying areas within the Moss Landing where we could have a dune restoration and dune migration zones, a beach nourishment and a wave barrier zones, areas where we've identified we would need to fill parking or provide uh, low relief berms to restrict um, both tidal flooding as well as storm induced uh, wave overtopping of the dunes and waves progressing into the harbor and causing damage. Um, so another example of how we took the hazard, predicted hazards, translated that into site-specific uh, adaptations for one of our partners. We also, um, another hazard we identified um, is uh, the um, results of changes in rainfall patterns with more flashy, high-intensity storms over short periods as predicted in the future. Um, the, the result of those increased um, river uh, uh, flood um, conveyance coming up against higher ocean uh, levels at the confluence of, of our river mouths, leading to significant uh, flooding uh, 
Uh, here in the Moss Landing, Castroville area, we identified almost 2,000 acres of ag land that is um, at potential for flooding by the combined effects of sea level rise, coastal um, wave um, heights, and uh, fluvial uh, changes in, in river discharge. We, um, th through a partner, we identified that um, the 100 year discharge from the, um, the drainage that drains um, uh, the Salinas Valley um, and meets up with the old Salinas River um, near the Marine Lab is predicted to increase um, by 60% by 2100 with a medium emissions uh, projection and um, almost triple the amount of water coming down the small drainage by 2100 under a high emission scenario, uh, suggesting um, significant flooding. And this is a model output of um, what that flooding looked like on the terrain. And if anyone, um, when anyone says, well, this is just a model, how do you know? I found this, um, this photo here uh, from February 20th, uh, 2017 uh, from the local news after um, a recent flood event. And you can see the triangular areas in the fields that are actually predicted by this model, uh, showing that we are actually seeing the exact signal that um, these models are suggesting uh, will occur happening within uh, parts of our um, um, our local environment, suggesting that um, there's a lot of validity behind um, uh, the model outputs here. Understanding those those risks to the uh, the coast, the farmlands, to the communities of Castroville and Moss Landing, uh, we worked with. Um, regional uh, water management entities and a set a goal to identify watershed management projects that we could use with um, or implement in the watershed to reduce downstream uh, flooding. Uh, we did some GIS analysis and looked at multiple benefit opportunities, identified some um, areas within the watershed where retention basins, um, uh, habitat restoration, riparian setbacks, etc. could be employed and looked at the cumulative benefit of um, those projects on down, downstream flooding. And here's a model on the right um, uh, of a 100 year peak storm and 10 year peak storm in the black uh, diamonds, um, showing the uh, predicted um, cubic feet per second coming down the discharge, um, leading to a, a, a potential flooding of acreage um, in the lower valley. And you can see how uh, we've reduced the peak flows and the flooding of both storm events significantly if we were to implement these, act these projects. And so now we're actually working with uh, resource managers, et cetera, to identify how we move uh, from concepts to implementation so that we can achieve this reduction um, in um, uh, this, uh, this flooding and also um, uh, achieve additional environmental and social benefits at the same time. Another example of this, um, here, uh, here's the same area um, between Castroville and Moss Landing. Um, and all of the, um, the dates on here are um, the year that we and partners at Elkhorn Slough, et cetera, have um, uh, worked with the landowners to purchase portions of these properties and uh, um, transfer them to conservation or wetland restoration. Um, and I call this unmanaged uh, retreat. Um, basically, the farmers have found that these areas are now uh, too wet and problematic to farm, and that um, uh, instead they've been willing to work with uh, resource managers to um, purchase these lands and then transition them back into habitat like they were 100 years ago before we did much of the um, agricultural reclamation in the lower valley. We're now looking at how we can um, do a similar effort in the lower Salinas where we have um, these uh, predicted um, uh, future flooding events down this channel. While we can do some things in the upper watershed um, to reduce flooding, we also recognize that there, are, there is already flooding in this lower area. And so we set goals to evaluate managed retreat strategies and identify areas for improved flood attenuation through creek and wetland restoration. And uh, this one of the outputs is uh, more of a social um, project uh, uh, that we're working with local um, 
resource managers and um, beginning to have dialogues with the community of Casterville to trans transition their, uh, the reclamation ditch, which is this uh, di uh, a dirt ditch that pushes the water out to the coast into uh, habitat, a larger conveyance um, area that reduces flooding and habitat area and recreational area. Um, showing um, the combined benefits to agriculture, water quality, habitat, and the community of Castroville. And we call it Castroville to the coast so that people from Castroville could actually um, uh, walk or bike to their beach without having to cross uh, Highway 1 and have to uh, be in a car. So an example of um, a hazard that we've identified, a response that not only has environmental benefits, but social benefits as well. As we noted before, um, the dunes um, uh, are predicted to erode. And if the waves over top potentially flood uh, hundreds of acres of the lower Salinas Valley uh, with uh, salt water uh, impacting the, uh, uh, the agriculture and uh, some of the freshwater wetlands significantly. Uh, so our goal, um, based on that hazard, we set a goal to um, a work with state parks to ensure that the coastal dunes remain a functional barrier to wave surge that um, would otherwise flood the valley. And we are now working uh, with coastal conservation and research, state parks and others to um, address um, the, the key vulnerabilities of these dunes. One being ice plant that has uh, uh, solidified the dunes into their current um, uh, state and not allowing them to, um, to migrate and uh, grow and move and respond to changes in sediment or sand availability, wave patterns, uh, wind, et cetera, um, making them very uh, uh, unresilient to um, uh, changes in uh, wave patterns in the future. The second um, uh, ha uh, or uh, vulnerability is that many of the uh, pathways um, that people take from parking to the beaches come out directly perpendicular to um, the ocean and um, become excellent um, uh, funnels to um, reflect wave energy up through these areas, actually increasing erosion and encouraging uh, wave overtopping. We're now working with parks to realign uh, the, the pathways uh, to reduce that uh, vulnerability as well. Here are some examples of um, our recent efforts. Uh, oh, uh, this is some of Ivano's work on the left, uh, some of his cross sections um, showing that we have um, fairly uh, stable dunes at the top, but there is um, some kind of sand uh, movement and possibly accretion of the four dunes um, as we pull or dunes with native species that um, encourage uh, sand to settle and uh, create more uh, top topographic variability of the four dunes. And you can see on the right um, por a portion of the dunes that um, we've um, sprayed the ice plant a few years ago and is now in native cover and a portion right in the center where uh, the ice plant remains in place and it's uh, crowding out most of the natives. Um, and you can see from our data that over a few years of uh, spraying and hand pulling, we can get to near zero um, uh, cover of ice plant while um, maintaining or increasing uh, native plant um, com uh, community uh, densities in those same areas, uh, helping to reestablish some of the natural communities that we hope then will allow these students to be more um, uh, resilient and responsive to changes in sand um, availability and wave, um, um, wave intensity. So those are, those are some of the local um, examples of how we've taken findings from some of these hazard reports and translated them into projects, partnerships, um, objectives, um, that meet multiple goals and help our, um, our environmental and our, um, and our built in environments be more resilient to these hazards. Um, but we also identified some areas where we just don't have enough data yet to understand how resilient uh, 
some of these um, ecosystems are to the projected changes in sea level rise. And that's one of the areas that we're now um, <clears throat> focused on um, uh, with some of our um, research throughout California. Um, recently, we received money um, in uh, partnership um, through OPC and Fish and Wildlife in partnership with a number of other research institutions up and down the state to, um, to uh, establish a monitoring program for um, marine protected areas that are also estuaries. And we're using that, um, um, that um, funding and that monitoring program to also uh, generate uh, some necessary data on how resilient um, uh, estuaries are to uh, pro projected sea level rise. And I'll show you what that means. Um, for um, most of our coastal estuaries, Elkhorn Slough, San Francisco Bay, et cetera, um, the, um, the, est the marsh and the other um, uh, estuary habitats are um, distributed um, through in space within a very um, specific tidal range um, based on um, the local tide signature for, for that area with um, subtitle being um, routinely below the low tides. We have low marsh um, and high marsh areas where low marsh gets inundated uh, much more frequently, um, even at low tide and high marsh is often uh, dry except during those high tide uh, peaks. And then of course upland, which um, only sees uh, wave induced flooding um, and it's really not affected by the tides. And this is, um, this is a scene uh, throughout um, the world, a common pattern, local tidal signature really drives what the elevations of this, these different uh, parts of the plant community, uh, where they lay um, in um, uh, based on elevation and based on the tidal signature in that location. Um, others have generated models that then look at with different levels of sea level rise, uh, the projected transition of those ecosystems from high marsh, mid marsh, low marsh, mudflats, et cetera, to um, uh, different habitats with an increase in the, um, uh, the, that tidal signature over those same lands. And this, uh, uh, this curve on the right, I will try and explain, uh, the one um, in the center here shows that there, um, this, is the uh, this curve is the relative percent area that um, is within different um, habitat areas. And you can see that in blue is subtitle and you can see a small portion of many of these estuaries are in subtitle. A little bit more is in mud flat in the brown and then much of um, the acreage is in green, which is the um, low and um, high marsh habitats. With um, an increase in sea level rise, um, we can uh, project that uh, many of the, uh, much of the area that is currently in uh, marsh will actually be within the tidal range that, um, persist, um, that will persist uh, uh, mudflats, leading to a significant loss, as you can see in these two maps of Seal Beach, of um, the marsh um, plain and transitioning much of that into mudflat and subtidal habitat. Um, this is directly associated with um, changes in water elevation and, and re retaining of the local uh, tidal signature. But for barbell estuaries or river mouth estuaries that have a, um, a beach that closes off periodically to restrict or um, limit um, uh, tidal action and um, river discharge, we see a much different um, uh, uh, hydrograph uh, signature. Uh, the blue line here in the middle of this graph, this is from a paper Kevin and I published last year, showing for one of uh, the estuaries where we put in um, uh, water elevation um, uh, monitoring equipment. You can see you can have for many months um, a fairly static state of water elevation within um, a marsh that then um, Br uh, breaches at, um, due to a winter a storm event or other. And you can see that all of a sudden you have a much more dynamic tidal signature or water elevation signature, partially um, uh, from tides, 
partially from uh, river discharge and partially uh, due to um, the mouth closing um, periodically. And you can see in you know, a green circle here about uh, for this, um, this period for this um, barbell estuary, we had only a, a, about a, a few weeks where the, um, the water um, elevation um, signature is primarily tidal and not having to do with either river inputs, um, uh, bar formation, or um, other, other um, causes. <coughs> and then here, and the small graph in C, you can see that different parts of the marsh see not daily flooding signatures, but um, seasonal uh, flooding signatures that are much different than uh, um, coastal estuaries. And so th therefore, the, uh, the patterns of marsh um, uh, plain uh, linked directly to local elevation um, due to a tidal, a tidal signature does not apply in these, um, in these systems. And um, it, it's a very um, distinct and different um, dynamic that is uh, a lot harder to understand. And so to understand if the, uh, how these uh, estuaries will be resilient to sea level rise, uh, we've worked with um, uh, other researchers for Southern California to help build a um, habitat change index model for bar-built estuaries that takes into account mouth dynamics, uh, sea level rise, and uh, importantly, marsh plain accretion, sediment accretion on the marsh plain as an important factor in determining how the marsh can actually um, grow in elevation with the changes in water elevation and uh, theoretically be resilient um, to certain uh, changes or increases in um, sea level and thus inundation. All of that can be calculated. Um, you take in all of these various uh, environmental factors, run it through some kind of cool program, and we can actually extrapolate out changes in marsh and habitat, um, marsh area and um, identify habitat loss. This is, this is a great model, but one of the problems was that we do not have um, a full understanding of the current um, habitat types, the elevations of those marsh plains, and very importantly, the accretion rates of these watersheds. And so that, that's one of the, uh, those are some of the data that we're um, going to be collecting as we go up and down the state as part of this marine protected area research. Here's a couple of examples of uh, these are different estuaries in the little um, uh, graph on the left. This is from the same publication. And over time, this is a year um, starting in December through, um, uh, or January through December. And you can see when the marsh plain was flooded for each of these systems. And while they're all very different, they do have a seasonal signature. But importantly, they're all very different. You do not have um, two days a month where the tide is at a certain elevation um, in all, all of these estuaries. Because of the mouth and um, the discharge, these systems are acting very differently from um, uh, right, uh, coastal estuaries. And one thing we were able to do is through uh, surveys of the, um, the marsh plain, identify ranges of um, different plant species we find on these, these marshes not as has been done um, elsewhere in coastal marshes associated with um, a tidal height, but it, uh, which was, uh, we couldn't do in these systems, but based on an in, 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 in inundation um, periodicity. So how much of the time can, um, can these different plants be submerged or wetted um, um, and um, uh, survive. And so we look at where these different plants are found on the marsh plain and then are able to estimate based on our water elevation um, data when the, um, or what is the percent of the time that these different plant communities are wetted and be able to show um, the range associated with each of, each of these species. This is just preliminary data and we're, um, we're gonna be collecting more of that with the, our new research. So how do we understand a um, sediment um, marsh plain accretion, which is um, 
the important um, piece of information to determining whether these marsh plains are going to be flooded um, and transition into mudflats or if they're going to be able to um, grow, accumulate sediment and grow to, um, um, to keep up with the predicted um, uh, changes in uh, ocean levels into the future. And he, here's an um, example of a feldspar marker that was placed in um, a local, uh, well, in the old Salinas River behind the, um, the uh, marine lab, showing the marker that was placed out there a, a couple of years ago and that you can then go out periodically, take, take a, a, a sample and then measure the accretion rate um, that has occurred since the date that that um, uh, marker was uh, placed on the estuary. And from that, you can see over on the left, these are some data from uh, Elkhorn Slough showing various accretion rates of different marshes within the, um, within, um, the, the greater Elkhorn estuary. Um, just extrapolating two years of data, which is not enough, but um, it's at least showing we are having accretion, but using these initial data, you could estimate that there's about a half a um, centimeter a year of uh, sediment accretion on this marsh plain, um, which is uh, quite a bit. But uh, over the next hundred years, uh, the predicted uh, annual increase in ocean levels is uh, predicted to be uh, one and a half centimeters a year. Of course, it doesn't happen um, uh, in a linear um, um, pattern, it's actually increases the rate of sea level rise in the future. Um, but we can see just from these back of the envelope um, estimates that the current accretion rates on this marsh are not, uh, not enough to, um, over the long uh, term, keep up with sea level rise. The question is, as sea level rise increases, will we see increased accretion rates as um, changes in rainfall patterns? Um, lead to greater erosion of our watersheds? Will we see more sediment on the marsh plain, um, possibly aiding the accretion of the, um, the marsh plain? These are all things uh, we want to investigate, but until we have a, uh, a marker out on these estuaries to identify what time zero, it's very difficult to um, uh, estimate or understand the, the multiple um, uh, uh, variables and um, uh, parameters that are occurring. So, for uh, moving forward, um, for our next work, we're going, uh, we're going to be going out for the next two years to two, uh, 15 more estuaries, about half of which are river mouth estuaries, and doing much uh, more of this um, uh, cumulative data collection. We're going to be having water um, uh, elevation sensors uh, within the, uh, each of these estuaries to understand the um, the water elevation signature uh, that's unique to each. We're going to be doing plant community um, uh, surveys of the marsh plains to understand um, and fine tune the range of um, where these plants are able to occur given these unique um, uh, uh, inundation patterns. And uh, with these data, we'll be able to better use these models that we've generated to um, predict which of these estuaries are likely resilient to the risks of sea level rise and coastal climate change, and which of them are, uh, may uh, be uh, vulnerable to a transition from marsh to uh, mudflat or um, uh, deep water habitat. So um, th that's a short ex example of how we have taken um, the projected risks of future sea level rise and transition them both into um, uh, local actions that could be adopted and implemented to um, minimize the future effects on our uh, coastline, both built and natural, um, and then also identify uh, data gaps that we really need to fill if we're gonna truly understand how some of our uh, natural ecosystems um, can respond uh, to these predicted changes. And, um, and we're excited to um, work with our partners to collect these additional data. As far as uh, climate adaptation next steps go, I always like to finish with a slide about what we can all be thinking about um, 
And first and foremost, um, my first slide, uh, or one of my first slides showed the three di uh, different curves as far as sea level rise based on different uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I don't, uh, I, I never wanna um, uh, speak over the importance of uh, us continuing to um, address climate change through reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are a lot of good um, local plans. I got to re write the one for the city of Santa Cruz that outline ways um, that we can all work together to re um, reduce emissions, many of which uh, also save us money and encouraging our leaders to push forward with those, uh, uh, those plans is critical or we're gonna have to uh, deal with the, uh, the red line instead of the yellow. Also, um, I'd recommend we all discuss the impacts and implications of these predicted hazards, uh, friends, family, and uh, uh, community leaders, and then ask uh, for, for um, additional information, understanding the cost of adaptation, um, and perhaps um, the short-term short costs of building sweet seawalls if you take into account the, uh, the long-term loss of beaches, habitat, uh, sand, et cetera, um, may suggest that um, what seems like more aggressive alternatives, like removing infrastructure from harm's way, may actually be the least uh, costly um, adaptation strategy. Then also considering the secondary impacts of our adaptation strategies, both uh, beneficial to the environment and to communities, as well as negative support uh, equitable strategies um, that um, I take into account the needs of all of our community, inc including the, na the natural community. And then I'm always advocating for streamlining the implementation of the preferred strategy through reduced um, uh, bureaucracy, permitting, et cetera. If we know where we need to go, um, we should um, start moving in that direction as quickly as possible. And hopefully if we can all do these things together, we can actually um, as a region and a set of communities decide smartly what we want our coastline to look like by 2060 and start taking the actions we need to get there. Thank you. How's that Ivano? Thank you, so that was great. Thank you, Ross, thank you very much. And I just clapped virtually, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know how this works. I wish, I'm sure that everyone will be very excited. And, and it was a great talk. I really, I really enjoyed it. It's, uh, you covered a lot of different things. There's a lot to, uh, but actually everything came together very nicely. I mean, it's all connected and I really appreciate that. So I'd like to remind the audience that if they wanna ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, um, so I can actually see who wants to ask. I see clapping around, that's great. Oh, good. <laughs> so I'll start with a question and then, uh, you know, again, please uh, uh, raise your hand if you have a question for, for Ross. And uh, well, I have, you know, I have lots of questions, right? Because you just stimulated me a lot. But I just wanna ask you one question to start with, which is when you were showing the predictions for the coastal uh, trends in Santa Cruz, right? Showing how harboring will, you know, will, will change the, 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 will actually evolve into uh, losing some of the beaches and uh, as sea level rises. Uh, w was the model based solely on accommodation space for beaches? In other words, once you, you know, run out of space and you're gonna, you know, the ocean is gonna hit the sea cliff and so there's no place for the beach to form or was the model also taking into account changes in uh, say, um, input of sediments from, from the main sources, uh, meaning like the San Lorenzo River, sediments that eventually end up making up the beaches. So you need sand to build up beaches, obviously, or, and or changes in wave regime. So the fact that uh, with climate change, you're also gonna have a change pro possibly in the directions of storms hitting the coastline so that you're actually changing the, the uh, swashings, uh, swashing of sediments around in other words, we throw transfer. So it might actually change also that type of uh, transfer of sediments from sources to sea. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. And um, uh, the, the models are not uh, that um, precise. 
they do account for um, projected increases in wave runoff energy leading to backshore erosion, et cetera. Um, the, uh, my understanding is the, um, that the erosion models uh, account for the uh, sediment addition from um, those er um, cliff ero um, erosion episodes. Um, I don't think it accounts for s uh, sediment um, added to the system from uh, our various uh, creeks and rivers. Um, and, but for the most part, it's, um, it's looking at as um, water elevation increases, what portions of the beach are going to be flooded at high tide. And you can see that under the current uh, uh, ele uh, elevation and topography of these beaches, you're, base you're basically flooding the dry sand area while not allowing the back shore to migrate inland to repopulate dry sand area. And so that's where you get the, uh, the coastal squeeze. Um, but some of the adaptation uh, alternatives do take it um, into account the potential feasibility of uh, beach nourishment, um, uh, raising of, uh, you know, um, existing or uh, new structures to retain sand in certain areas and build up those beaches. Um, those, are, those are ideas. They have significant implications to um, down, down uh, beach um, segments of the coast by modifying the, uh, litor uh, the littoral drift, et cetera. Um, the, one of the things we're looking at for the city of Santa Cruz is kind of a beach recycling, um, sand recycling, where uh, when it's um, purged from uh, the Santa Cruz Harbor, it's currently put a discharge down coast and continues on its way. And some thoughts are perhaps we use a portion of that dredge sand and haul it back up to the other end of Santa Cruz and add it to um, the, the sand supply uh, that would then continue down the coastline and basically um, increase that, uh, the, the sand within that local um, uh, littoral zone area. Whether or not that's feasible or effective, let alone cost effective, um, is uh, for others to decide. But those are some of the things that are being considered. Excellent. Th thank you. And I, I will have a follow-up question, but I see that Jim, uh, Jim Harvey has raised his hand. So I'm going to mute you, Jim. Great. Thanks, Ivano. Uh, thanks, Ross. That was great. Um, my question is about the moss lining area and specifically and because of the Monterey Submarine Canyon is also a place for uh, a sink for sand but also and sediments but also uh, deviates the wave energy coming into moss lining. So, so can you talk a little bit about how the canyon might affect some of these predictions uh, especially in the moss lining region? Well as a lot of us know um, the wave patterns in the moss landing uh, uh, are directed um, differently to different parts of the beach, which have led to the current um, uh, uh, coastline um, within that area. And um, how I translate it to the submarine canyon. Well, anyway, they, um, the models that we use to predict changes in wave runoff energy do account for um, the refraction from uh, the coastline, the, uh, the shallow uh, offshore um, uh, areas as well as the um, submarine canyon. But it does suggest that um, uh, future wave uh, runup is going to um, affect the Moss Lane Island significantly um, and potentially overtopping in areas where we don't have um, structures or other kind of uh, reinforcement. And if you start getting uh, waves overtopping the, um, the, the, the peninsula there um, and flowing into the harbor, we're going to have, a lot, as you can all imagine, have a lot of serious problems. So that's some of the things in the Moss Lane and Harbor report we tried to identify. And as Jim, you know, we're uh, having discussions with State Parks, Ambari, and Moss Lane Relabs on how we can all work together with the harbor to um, 
enhance the resiliency of that um, that sand spit, given that it is in uh, in uh, directly uh, um, onshore of the submarine canyon. So, uh, can I ask one follow up question that's kind of related, and that's um, is there any modeling that's been? I'm sure there's been modeling that's been done, but I don't know it of it uh, regarding how with climate change and changes in the whole atmospheric conditions with climate change over time, how that will change the center of, of uh, storm events. So in other words, uh, the storm's gonna be in this, coming from the same direction over time as, as the climate changes. That's a really good question. And I don't think any of the models account for those kinds of changes. Uh, I think that they're a little bit more simplistic than that and looking at uh, the increased energy of a storm leading to, uh, you know, changes in pressure fronts and um, uh, wave height that then uh, translate to uh, run up, a wave run up energy as it hits the coastline. But I don't think uh, uh, any of these models have yet to look at potential um, directional um, changes uh, from where these storms are likely uh, to originate from, no. Great, thanks Ross. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Thank, thank you, Rob. I, I can just add one thing about your question about the canyon dynamic is that uh, if you look at the, um, the coastal record of coastal erosion for the last, you know, essentially almost 100 years now, USGS has done a really uh, incredible work going back to the tea sheets and then eventually create those uh, coastline retreat um, um, uh, diagram. So they showed that actually Moss Lang is one of the most stable coastlines in the whole of California, <laughs> which is really interesting. I mean, like the head of the canyon is actually more stable than say Southern uh, Monterey Bay, where you have you know erosional rates up to one meter per year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a really puzzling thing. And one possibility is that actually the, the divergence that, that happens at the head of the canyon. So, you know, when the waves uh, kind of lock into the canyon's axis, they, 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 it's almost like a rail track. So they start diverging. So, and, and if you're a surfer, you know that pretty well. So when you when you're on Mount Slimming Beach, the waves are actually coming from the, uh, they're, they're kind of rotating, mm. and uh, and then the, and then when you do have uh, segment transport from the south, you're piling up sediments locally. So there's a chance that that kind of a very unique dynamics has helped the the resilience of that beach so far. Um, and also the erosion in Southern Monterey Bay, which is again one of the fastest erosions in California. And actually, I would say probably, you know, worldwide, actually has provided a lot of sediments that eventually end up somewhere, which can be actually most Lightning Beach. That's one of the ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So erosion on one side actually benefits accumulation on the other side. You know, it's sad, but it's it's a mechanism. You know. Uh... Different uh, management um, options for the Salinas River to improve uh, Salmonid habitat and the closure of the, uh, the last sand mine in Marina uh, may um, have more of a local um, uh, effect on our coastline than uh, at least near term um, uh, climate um, changes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let me see if there's any other question. I don't see any hand raised. So I'm gonna ask you my second kind of a follow-up question and then hopefully if there's anyone else that wants to ask a question, then we'll move to our... Uh, uh, it is happier. Yeah, you know, I know you're ready for that. So, <laughs> uh, well. so uh, may maybe what I'm gonna, about to say is kind of not very popular, but it's it's kind of, true, which is that uh, you were talking about bar-built estuaries, and uh, I happened to work on one of them, which you know that it's Pescadero. Yep. And uh, so I know that pretty well because I just worked on it, but you know, I'm, I'm not as familiar as, as you are with the other ones in California elsewhere. But you know, one of the things that uh, uh, was kind of surprising at first, but then it became clear is that much of the lowlands, the wetlands in Pescadero are very new features which are not natural at all in a way, but they derive from the fact that during the log, heavy logging and uh, changes in the watershed, there was a, a period at the beginning of the last century, which was very, very uh, much characterized by erosion and mass gravity transport. So that basically you 
uh, uh, a lot of sediments were dumped into this um, estuarine environment to create these low-laying areas. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the modern coastline there is actually much of it is a reflection of uh, logging and the man-made kind of uh, changes, which is also true in the East Coast. There are many lo local uh, uh, marshlands actually that are uh, there because of sediments were coming from, uh, from uh, increased erosion inland. So taking that to a different point, I was thinking, if you think about an increase in, in uh, intensity or rain events and increase in forest fires, which you know we're witnessing, it's possible yeah. actually the, the, there would be an increase of sediments delivered to the system. Um, and therefore, actually, that might counteract some of the original trends. Is this something that, does it make sense? And is this something you guys have considered in your- It is, that's why, um, why um, one of our working hypotheses is that of the est uh, estuarine habitat in California, these river mouth barbell estuaries may be the most um, resilient to sea level rise because they have uh, such um, a, such a localized sediment source that uh, that uh, seems to have a um, uh, a way of establishing um, uh, being distributed on the marsh plain in a way that supports um, uh, a healthy marsh ecosystem. And so, theoretically, if we have somewhat natural um, processes occurring, that, uh, the, that um, marsh plain building may be um, more than um, uh, sufficient to keep up with the predicted changes in ocean levels and uh, uh, presumably changes in uh, the beach uh, bar uh, raising water within uh, the, the perched lagoon as well. So yeah, we, do, we are thinking about that. Having a local um, sediment source, we think, um, uh, is uh, an important com um, consideration for um, uh, how resilient these systems are. And that's why we were, we're um, intending to go out and put uh, markers on these marsh plains to investigate that further. Excellent. That makes sense. And, uh, you know, uh, we, it, when, when we want to preserve something, we have to keep in mind that that something might actually be already something that's been modified because of us. So, yeah. So, and, uh, yeah. So, and understanding, that's a really good point, Ivano, understanding the processes that drive um, the complexity of these, mar uh, these uh, barbell estuaries is what we're really trying to understand better. So, um, and uh, so that we can uh, work on, uh, from a resource management standpoint, work on maintaining um, the, the variability and the complexity of these uh, physical di uh, dynamics that um, lead to uh, these uh, self-sustaining ecosystems, opposed to um, focusing on preserving specific habitat types within the system, um, striving to work really preserve the, uh, uh, the, the physical dynamics that drive the creation and uh, uh, sustainability of them. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Thank 